So about a month ago, I had the opportunity to sit in on a citizenship ceremony uh, just right down uh, the street here. Uh, some friends of mine uh, were becoming uh, Canadians. And so my whole family got to go, me and Christine and the two kids, and we were especially kind of interested in this because because we're American, uh, but we've been here for over six years now, and maybe in about a year, uh, we'll be able to become Canadian citizens. And so we were just really kind of fascinated with what we saw. And as I was sitting there, I couldn't help but think about, well, what would be the big differences between a Canadian citizenship ceremony and an American <laughs> citizenship ceremony? What might be some of the different emphases? Because one of the things we noticed as we were sitting there and listening to everything that the judge had to say in the different speeches is that if there was one kind of main theme that kind of ran through it, it was to be a Canadian means that we are going to work together for a better world. And that was really the main theme. Everything she seemed to have to say had to do in one regards with let's work together to make things better. And the idea was working together. So how might that be different than an American a citizenship ceremony. I would bet you that rather than the theme being working together, if there was one word you would hear repeated over and over again in an American citizenship ceremony, it would probably be the words rights. Right? That, uh, that now that you have become an American citizen, you have rights that will be protected and we are all about upholding individual rights. So maybe a big difference between the two. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, and so maybe that would lead us to think there's some very big differences com compared to the rebel spirit maybe of, of the U.S. and, and the more uh, cooperative uh, neighborly spirit of Canada. And I think there are definitely those differences. There's no question about it. But how different are we really, do you think? Do we not care much about our rights? This last week, as I was reading through articles, especially dealing with the upcoming elections and whatnot, there was some polls that came out, and these are the top things that we are most interested in in the upcoming elections. Okay, so these are the top ones. Uh, uh, it's not all of them, but these are right up there. First, cost of living, health care, taxes, housing affordability, and good jobs and wages. That's an interesting top five. And when we think about that, are the reasons that we're so interested in the work of our politicians, because what we're really interested in is that what they do is that they will help our neighbors with their cost of living, and help our neighbors with their health care, and help our neighbors with the amount of taxes that they pay for, or our neighbors with their housing affordability, or our neighbors with their wages, or, is our gut response. The first thing we usually think about is I want to make sure that the mission of my politicians has to do with helping with my cost of living, helping with my health care and my taxes and my housing affordability and making sure that I have good wages. And maybe after reflection and thinking about, about it for a little bit, then we start maybe thinking about other people. But our gut reaction a lot of times, isn't it? If we're really honest with ourselves, is that our gut reaction is we want to make sure that we and our families, that they are being taken care of. And the people we don't know in our communities, usually that's kind of a second thought. And that's very just human of us to think like that. Our politicians' missions a lot of times we think is, is it ought to make things as good as possible for me, but then also others. But me, but also others, right? It's always kind of this, this me-focused thing first. If you were to describe your family's mission, not the mission that you want for your politicians, but your own family's mission, the things that you teach your kids, what is it that you generally kind of communicate with them if you've got kids? Or maybe if this is your, if you're single, the, the way that you think about your own life as well. Is it that you want your progeny to get a good education so that 
They can help other people do well, or is it usually we talk to them about them having a good education so that they can do well? Is it that we want our kids to have good jobs so that they can meet the needs of other people? Or is it generally the way that we teach as we teach our kids, we want you to have a good job so that you can take care of yourself? And so there seems to be this very human thing that our gut response, our gut reaction is we want to preserve and make sure that we ourselves are taken care of. It's very human, very human. But what would happen if that was the way that God thought? If God's main gut reaction was to take care of himself and make sure that he's, all of his needs are met, do you think he would have ever gotten off that throne out of heaven? If he was most interested in making sure that he was taken care of, and that he flourished, do you think he would have ever gotten up on that cross? The reality is that the mission of God is radically different than the typical missions that we have in our culture and individually as human beings. He radically reprioritizes these things. And that's what Peter is talking about here. At the very end of this letter, the last thing that he wants to leave these Christians with is what is the unique mission of God's church here on earth. And just think about the position that Peter is in. Peter is, is writing from the city of Rome, and he was especially at this time trying to evangelize and share the gospel with Romans. Think back to the historical Roman time period. What are the first thoughts that pop into your head? I say Rome, you say, what are some of the big things? Now I'm looking for interaction. I say Rome, you say, what's up? What's up? Okay, we're going to go before that, right? Historic Catholic Church isn't around yet, right? That's not going to happen for a few more hundred years. Talking around zero AD, the Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, Caesars right? Uh, emperors, military expansion, strength. Um, I, I asked this on Wednesday night and someone yelled out, pasta, right? Uh, yeah. Different emphasis right now. Yeah, but the idea of strength, right? Military power. What kind of structures do you think of when you think Roman Empire? Great big structures, coliseums where gladiators fought to the death and where people were screaming and yelling for their athletes and for their warriors that they thought were the greatest heroes, right? These embodiments of gods on earth and their great temples and this idea of power and might. And so picture your Peter now in the empire of Rome, in the city of Rome itself, and he's trying to share his Jesus. This Jesus that was not a great warrior. This Jesus that was not a great statesman, that was not a gladiatorial hero, but instead was a rather backwater poor guy that ended his life dying as a criminal on a cross. How's Peter going to share this gospel? At the heart of the message of Peter is embracing the suffering of Jesus that he went through and demonstrating as clear as possible that the service of God, in fact, what we could talk about is even the submission of Christ, that somehow in that submission and service, God's strength is put on full display, a strength that we cannot find anywhere else in this universe. And so, Peter ends his letter with these words that he was a witness of Christ's suffering. It's the last thing he wants to leave with these Christians. He was a witness of Christ's sufferings. Why did Christ suffer? Why would the Messiah, the God of this universe, suffer for you and me? Well, we were designed from the start for selflessness. We were designed to put other people first. In fact, that first Adam, he was created to have who would be number one in his life? God is number one. And who's number two in Adam's life? 
Eve. He is entirely outward focused, completely selfless, and Eve was designed to be the exact same way, God first, spouse second, completely outward thinking and selfless. And how long did it take for this creature designed for selflessness to corrupt himself and to corrupt herself into being a creature whose first response, gut response now, is actually selfish. It's all about preserving the self. And after that first sin, that became our destiny, so to speak. We were all born with this sinful nature, this me first nature, this selfishness that shoves us away, that makes us run in the opposite direction of God. But what did Christ do for you and me? This, this Christ that suffered, that Peter was a witness of. Peter calls Jesus the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd. Do you remember a time that Peter might have heard Jesus call himself a shepherd? Maybe even call himself the good shepherd. What did that good shepherd do? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The story of God, the true story of God, is that he got off his throne, a God entirely selfless, put all of his needs below ours, and he came down to serve you and me to the point of giving his life for you and me as the good shepherd, as the chief shepherd. And now as this chief shepherd, he calls us his sheep to follow him. So there was this uh, inventor, his name was R.G. Turnow, and he was a major inventor. He had over 300 inventions and patents, and he became a millionaire, did very well for himself, especially with construction equipment. But that's not what he's most remembered for. What he's most remembered for is that this millionaire, brilliant man, uh, slowly throughout his life as he continued to make more and more money, he began adding one or two percent of everything that he made to his gifts, to his God, through his offerings, to the point that eventually in his life, he gave 90 percent of what he made, 90 percent of his income he gave to his God. And so he says this at one point, I shovel out the money, and God shovels it back. But God has a bigger shovel. That's the difference, right? So what would motivate a millionaire to give 90% of everything? What would motivate a millionaire to give 90%? A God who gave 100%. And that is what we have. Our God who gave absolutely everything for you so that your sins, all of them, including those sins of selfishness, covered entirely by his blood, the penalty for it entirely taken on him instead so that you might live and not just live, but flourish, but flourish as his child under his care, the good shepherd. And he now calls us into a very similar life. If the whole ethic of God and the whole ethic of Christ could be summarized in the word of service, then the whole ethic of the Christian can be summarized in one word too, the same word, service. And so Peter ends with these words. He says, so those of you that have been called as shepherds of God's flock, Mirror the chief shepherd. What did the chief shepherd do? He gave his life. In the exact same way, you smaller shepherds, he says, be eager to serve, not lording it over. So what is the chief quality of someone that wants to be a leader in God's church on earth? The chief quality is that you want to serve, that you want to do the exact opposite of what leaders are supposed to be that you want to place yourself under everyone else as a servant, and under everyone else as a servant, you do this eagerly. You desire to do it eagerly. 
And then after that, in the following verse, the, the, the verse 5, which, which we don't have here, he talks to, to the other people. And he says, uh, to the younger people, he says, submit yourselves to your elders. In other words, it's not just the leaders that need to serve, but I'm looking at everyone else to place themselves under and to serve as well, to submit, to put the people around you first. And so that's Peter. Paul, you know the language that Paul uses to speak about the Christian life elsewhere. What does Paul say about the government? He says we ought to submit to authorities. That just as our God came to serve and place himself under our needs, we are called to place ourselves under the authorities that are around us as well, to serve and to pray for them and to desire nothing but their well-being and to help the authorities in our lives to succeed. And he goes on and he talks about submitting to one another. You know this from Paul. Submit to one another. And then he goes on and he says to the husbands, he says, husbands, as Christ loved the church, I want you to love your wives. And how did Christ love the church? He served the church. He placed himself under the church, the needs of the church he put first. And so what does he call husbands to do but to put the needs of their wives first above their own? The point of being a husband in God's eyes is to serve your wife and to put her needs first over your own, just as Christ loved the church. And then he says to wives, submit to your husband. Submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. Peter, at the very end, says to everyone, clothe yourselves in humility. What's the attitude of a servant? Someone who knows that they really have the status of servants. Our perfect and holy God, the Lord of the universe, has given us a gift, his life. We know our own sins. We know how we compare to him. Peter ends with recognize who you are and what your God has done for you. So we're not being sent on a mission by our God to make sure that our needs are met. We don't have to do that because all of our needs have been met. We have a God that meets all of our spiritual needs, dying for us on the cross and giving us everything we need spiritually so that we are in his family now and forever and heaven waits for us. He promises in that, in that uh, uh, Lord's Prayer, which we're going to be praying in a minute, that he gives us all of our physical needs, that he meets all of our physical needs, everything that we need between now and death. Maybe not everything you want, but everything that you need to flourish as a child of God is given to you. He has met all of our needs and now calls us into the mission of placing the needs of everyone else first. And so if we've got nothing to worry about, then we are free to join in this mission that our leader, the chief shepherd, calls us into. So, when's the last time that you've taken a look at your budget, maybe? Thinking about reprioritizing here. And set aside money, and I'm not talking about offerings, I just mean setting aside money to help people that are in need. Do you have a line in your budget where you are putting aside money so that when needs arise and the people that God has placed in your life that you can help them with that? Hmm? That's one of the first things we do in our pre-marriage courses when we talk about money is we tell our, our brand new couples here at church, find that line, 5 to 10%. Put that away right after offerings. And speaking of offerings, right, um, it's, it's kind of uh, in, in our busker community here, uh, it's kind of misleading that we have the offering after the sermon because it almost feels as if that offering is we put on a performance and now we're passing around the basket. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're salaried, right? Uh, and even if we weren't, Pastor Getzering and I, 
We do not do this for the money. We do not care one bit what goes into that offering basket. Those offerings, the only reason that that basket is going around is because as Christians, we believe on the one hand that our God has given us everything. And because he has given us everything as a trust, we return to him our first fruits. And on the other hand, we've got work to do in this community. We've got work to do and that money goes to support the gospel ministry that we do here and throughout the world and it supports the other ways that we interact with our community here and throughout the world. When's the last time that you've taken a look at the priorities of the ways that you've spoken to your kids about why you bring them up and what you want what's best for them? When's the last time that you've talked to them about seeking jobs and good educations so that they're in a better position to serve? When's the last time that you've taken a look at your social priorities? When you've taken a look at the time that you've spent with your friends, and in that time, how much of it has it been to serve their greatest need, their need to hear about Christ? We have been called into a radical mission, and the name of that radical mission is submission. We have been called to place the needs of the people in our lives above and beyond our own. Because on the one hand, we've been freed to do that through our Christ who has done everything for us. And on the other hand, that new spirit within you wants to do that, loves your neighbor, loves those who Christ has died for, and you want to serve just like your Christ served. And when we do this, when we put this into action, just as when Christ died on that cross, there was a strength put on display that the world has never seen before. You are called now to mirror that strength in the way that you serve and to show your community a strength that they may have never seen before. That is our mission. And I pray to God that you stay in his word where he continues to grow you in that mission and conviction in that mission. Through the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Please stand. May the peace of God that transcends all understanding may dwell richly in your hearts and in your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.